So we can go at Hi everyone, we are back and today we welcome Caleb Silver, editor in chief of Investopedia. Caleb, hello, hi to New York. Thank you for having me. Nice to meet you and it's a pleasure to be here. New York says hello to you in Prague. Thank you very much. Uh, I was preparing like one quick uh, question for you regarding like how far away is uh, New York from Prague, but I, then I was like, no, uh, I don't want to do it. <laughs> I don't yeah, want to. That would be a huge guess. Yes, yes, exactly. So, so let's just jump right into um, uh, your story, your experience, your your insights. I know you're very experienced. So really looking forward to do this interview with you. So maybe let's just start with your days uh, in Bloomberg. Uh, maybe if you can uh, tell us something more about the biggest lessons you have learned at the Bloomberg regarding business, regarding life, maybe also uh, talking to Mike Bloomberg a few times. I don't know. Uh, what, what was your experience? Well, Bloomberg was a tremendous place to start as a business journalist, but I was an accidental business journalist. I actually grew, grew up in the restaurant industry in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I, where I grew up. Um, but I learned how to be a television cameraman. So I knew how to operate a television camera and I own one. When I moved to New York to go to graduate school, I used to work as a freelance cameraman shooting stories for Bloomberg and CNBC and CNN. And so that's kind of how I got my start in the media industry. I was at graduate school and we had an internship program with Bloomberg. And um, Bloomberg was really just starting out as a news organization. The terminal had already been in existence, the famous Bloomberg terminal where it makes all of its money, but it wanted to create news as an add-on for its subscribers. So it created Bloomberg News and then Bloomberg Television was born out of that. It was just kind of a baby little TV network and it was a great place for me to start because I already had the experience knowing how to shoot. And then I started to become a producer as an intern and I was doing amazing stories as a you know, 24, 25 year old, just, just as a baby in the industry. When I finally finished graduate school, ultimately Bloomberg hired me to become a TV producer. And this was in 1988 and 1999 when the internet bubble mattress was just starting to really get big. And companies like AOL and Netscape and um, Yahoo were just coming on the scene and they were becoming these big uh, popular companies and the stocks were getting wild and big. And I was covering all of this for the first time as a business journalist, and it was fascinating. I was meeting Jeff Bezos when he was just uh, launching Amazon.com. I was meeting some of the great entrepreneurs that, that have built some of the biggest internet companies in the world. But the thing about Bloomberg is it's a very serious news organization, and there is a Bloomberg way. In fact, there's a book that you have to read when you get hired called The Bloomberg Way. Um, and it has some very strict rules about journalism uh, and some formulas for doing it right. It's very exacting. and um, I had just come through graduate school, so I had journalism experience, but I didn't have that business experience. And working at Bloomberg was like going to business school. In fact, you had to take courses in what they called Bloomberg University. So there were courses on the stock market, courses on the Federal Reserve, courses on foreign exchange. And you had to take those in order to remain as an employee, as a journalist at Bloomberg News, which was a deep, deep dive into learning how businesses work and then how to write about them and make television about them, which was kind of a new thing too. Making TV about uh, business news was, you know, it, it launched in the 80s, but it really got going in the 90s with the internet bubble. Mm. Wow, nice. And wh what were the, let's say, those, those rules which you, which you have to read and go through them? Um, uh, what were the, the most, like, let's say, interesting for you at the time? They have something at Bloomberg called the, the five F's, and I'm going to forget all of them, but it was something like first, fastest, factual, forward, and one other I'll think of in a minute. Um, so just framing to everything like we want to be first and we want to be factual. And they go, I would say, even overboard at Bloomberg compared to other news organizations with, um, with their sourcing, uh, with their attribution with updating and rewriting articles, Bloomberg is a machine when it comes to producing content. They'll update a news story about just eight, nine, 10 times a day if you look at the wire. Um, and so that was important. And, and learning how to do that, uh, with that type of exactitude was a really good lesson for me. But it was also, you know, business news was moving so fast at that time. CNBC, which is a big TV network here, business network, and um, CNN had, had business networks, and and Bloomberg was just trying to compete there. So we were really moving fast. 
uh, as a young organization, but we had a lot of money behind us because we had Mike Bloomberg uh, back in the company, which kind of helps. Yeah, and this was, I guess, uh, like his way, he's, he was trying to put maybe his soul, you know, to this business and so you can grow and be so like professional. Have you have a chance like to, to be around him, to talk with him uh, and how maybe his business mindset was working that time? Yeah, I, I have had the chance to meet him a few times. I'll tell you about the first time I met him when I, on my first day as an employee, but the first time I ever experienced Mike Bloomberg, I was at a broadcasting conference um, in Las Vegas or, or something. And, uh, you know, there, he was a keynote speaker and this was in the early nineties and he was on stage and he said, you know, one day we're not going to have newspapers anymore where we're looking at the newspaper like this. We're going to have some sort of a screen where we're touching the stories we want to touch. It's 1993, uh -huh. 94. And my mind just went, you know, it exploded. And I said, this is a guy I want to work for. This guy sees around the corner. He sees the future. I want to be a part of what he's doing. Um, and so, you know, some way I wound my way to Bloomberg. And then when you, when you get hired at Bloomberg back in the day, Mike Bloomberg sat in the newsroom, in the TV newsroom, out in the open. And at Bloomberg, all the desks are open. Um, it's an open seating platform, one of the big, you know, media companies and big, big businesses to do that. And Mike's desk was right in the middle, right with everybody else's. Um, but it was a little bit bigger. Uh, so, you go in on your first day in orientation and you line up with the hiring person, the person who hired you, and they take you to meet Mike. And Mike's sitting there working at his <laughs> terminal and taking phone calls, but everybody's got to say hello to him on the way in. So um, as you go to meet Mike and it's your turn, uh, you know, he, he, he just looks up at you and they say, hey, Mike, this is Caleb. He's going to, you know, he's going to be producing TV. And he, Mike just looks up at you and says, don't mess it up. <laughs> and then you, you move on. So, Did anyway, you? It was a great place to. It was a great place to start my career. It made me nervous, but it was a great place to start my career, and it and it led me to where I am today. So I'm really grateful for my experience. Sure, very challenging uh, like environment, and your experience is really huge through the years in the news. And we are we are trying to teach our clients in those uh, tough times where uh, markets are crashing, they are going down to not really follow uh, news and media news because of the fear is even, even bigger and bigger. So maybe uh, this is a good question for you. So what information uh, should investors um, look for? Which media, how, how would you, what would you be, what would you, uh, what would be your advice to them? Okay. Well, news is noise, right? And I come out of the news industry. Investopedia is a little bit different. We do some news, but we're really doing it in an educational wrapper. Mm -hmm. But news is noise, and it's, it changes your, it distorts your way of thinking about your investing strategy or your saving strategy. Because if you invest or react to every headline, of course, you're never yeah. going to keep up and you're going to end up losing a lot of money because you'll never time it right. So news is noise. You have to filter it out. And for most investors, and it depends on how old you are and what your goals are and how much money and time you have, the key factors in investing, time and money, um, need to think about, let's say I'm, let's say I'm 30, you know, somebody you know, closer to your age than to my age. If I'm 30 and I have a time horizon of maybe 30 years to, to uh, grow income and invest, then I want to be thinking about my long-term goals. And my long-term goals are really tied to the investments that have the highest potential to give me a return over those years um, with some mitigated risk, but I have time to recover if the market turns down. So you want to be a long-term investor and concentrate on those types of trends, looking out. If you are older, like me, uh, you know, closer to 50 or, or approaching your 60s and, and retirement is near, and you need to try to accumulate or grow uh, wealth as fast as you can, mm -hmm. that's a little bit different. You need to be maybe paying a little bit more attention to trends that are happening within the markets because you want to move your money with momentum to, to catch on to those trends, uh, to take advantage of higher returns, but you have to be a lot more nimble. But if you have money and you're closer to retirement, then you want to be a lot more conservative and try to filter everything else out and make sure you have enough money growing over time to give you those monthly or yearly installments to allow you to live through retirement comfortably. Really depends on your age, but you have to find ways to, to put blinders up on the things that don't matter and then pay attention to the things that do, depending on your risk profile.
Mm -hmm. Do you follow any, because there are many pros, many uh, fi financial uh, podcasts and so on and so on, many information. Do you, or can you recommend us any professional which we should follow, which has very good insights and is really putting out their experience of like, let's say, long-term investor? Yeah. I, and uh, what I don't follow and what I don't recommend are stock pickers. They have their place in the world and yeah. they're important for people that want to pay attention to buying stocks and trying to play the market like a casino. That's not how I roll and, and Investopedia. We don't really do that either. But for people that want to learn about the markets and learn about investing and learn about trends, there's a few that I really like. There's one uh, by uh, my friend Barry Ritholtz. Um, it's called Masters in Business and it's on Bloomberg, in fact. Uh, that I think is very smart. And he talks to some of the smartest people in the industry across the world. I think that's really good. Um, I like what Real Vision is doing, and that's a subscription video network, and they have long form video and podcast conversations with some of the smartest investors and thinkers in the world. Animal Spirits is a podcast that I like, and that's by two friends of mine, uh, Michael Batnick and, and Ben Carlson, where they're talking about the markets, but they're also talking about pop culture, um, mm -hmm. They're talking about investing trends, but they're not really giving stock picks. It's thoughtful and fun, um, but I learn a lot. And then one more that I really, really like is called Invest with the Best uh, by Patrick O'Shaughnessy. And he is a very thoughtful investor and thinker who's not just thinking about investing uh, in the market, but he's thinking about holistic changes that are happening through the global economy. And, and I learn a lot from that. Thank you very much for that. Uh, this will be very useful even for me. Um, so we already I can started... send you to put it in the show notes. I'm sorry. I can send you the links. You can add them to your show notes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that will be fine. Uh, I, I, I Google it, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I was reading that Investopedia has around 2.500 million monthly users or 2 million 500, sorry, 2 million 500 monthly users. Is it correct? We have a, about 20, more than 20 million unique visitors around the world every month. Um, wow. We have about oh, okay. 12 or 13 million right here in the U.S. So it's about half in the U.S. and about wow. half overseas. Uh -huh. um, so we're a pretty big site. And we're a big site because we've been around a long time. We're 21 years old. Um, yeah. So we've been around the block and around the Internet for many, many years. But building our content and trying to improve it in the last few years, I would say we put a lot of focus on improving that content to make it the best it can possibly be and try to make sure that we're answering users' questions because we're getting user questions all the time from all over the world of people who are looking to save, invest, retire, plan, trade stocks, uh, learn the options market, understand for it. So you can imagine the volume we're getting. So we're focused a lot on making sure we have the right answers for everybody coming to the site. And what is the core thought or let's say the vision which Investopedia has uh, for like long term? Long term, and I think this has kind of always been the case, but more now so than ever, given everything that's going on, is to educate people about money, mm -hmm. to educate them about investing um, so they can make the right decisions to help them live a better life. Right? Mm -hmm. Finance and health are two of the key components in, in people's lives, and they often lead to... Uh, you know, health outcomes one way or the other. So we want to make sure people are learning what they need to learn about money to make the right decisions for themselves and their families to build the kind of financial foundation that they can live comfortably on. Uh, if we can like name it as a like golden rules of Caleb Silver of uh, investing and money management, uh, what would you say like first things which come up to your mind, maybe two, three things which maybe you even use or uh, you are also trying to recommend it to your listeners or sorry, to your, or your readers in Investopedia. Okay. Um, I think the most important for me is um, you can't outsmart the market. You shouldn't even try. Invest, um, invest with a strategy that you're comfortable with and that you can be consistent with over time. Be ready to make a change, but have a plan and stick to that plan and don't think you can outsmart the market or yourself. That's core to the way I have been investing all my life. But I also, you know, I have been through a couple of financial crises uh, and some serious bear markets. So 1999, 2000, um, uh, 1987, although I really didn't care about it back then when I was 17 years old, but 2008, 2009, and now this recent crisis. So I've learned a lot of lessons through that, but the most important one is stay the course, have the plan, stick to the plan. Don't try to outsmart the market or yourself. 
Thank you very much. And this is basically the, the next question which I wanted to ask this 2008 uh, financial crisis. So, so how was your situation back then? How do you, when you, when you reflect all this, uh, all these crazy times, crazy weeks, months, um, maybe from personal uh, standpoint, but also from as you, as you, as you felt the atmosphere in the, in the streets, how was it? Well, I was working at CNN at the time and I was running business news. I mean, I was working, uh, I believe on the, uh, yeah, I was running the business news division for CNN and I had a couple of TV programs that I did and I was producing for the, the top business anchor at CNN. So we were right in the middle of the financial meltdown and we were working through the weekend. We were working 20 hours a day and just going home, changing shirts, taking a shower and coming back in and covering it because the news was breaking so quickly mm. that we were literally moving from one topic to the other, one show to the next you know, ordering in food, I, it was like a blur, basically sleeping at, at CNN's offices. So uh, from a work standpoint, it was really intense, but it was an incredible time to be a business journalist because the things that were happening in the economy and the reaction to it by the Federal Reserve, um, by the US government, and by governments around the world was phenomenal to watch in real time. Um, so I felt like I was part of history and I was covering it. Uh, I was learning things in my ear as a producing for my anchor and telling them to him and he was saying them on the air 10 seconds later and that's a thrill that that you you know you live for if you're a journalist so that was cool um personally um we you know we had just had children um so it was a little you know i had two two little girls at the time and it was a little bit freaky um but i was gainfully employed and i was right in the middle of the story um but i was also realizing given my experience as a business journalist that what was happening with the Federal Reserve lowering interest rates as it did and all the monetary policy it was pushing to shore up the economy and what governments around the world were doing was fundamentally changing the equation for investors. Those low interest rates in the US and around the world made it for what we call TINA. There is no alternative, T-I-N-A. There is no alternative to stocks. And stocks from that point, the bottom in 2008-9 up until 2019 went on a 350 percent run in the u.s so i knew at the time that i needed to load up on stocks back then um and i made you know i, I made some portfolio decisions because i had had that experience as a journalist to know that when the federal reserve does this this is the only thing that can really happen so that changed the way i thought about being an investor and did you lose any money in some kind of your portfolios that time a tremendous amount of money <laughs> i took a tremendous hit um yeah, I didn't think I, you know, and I was, I was, you know, obviously younger, um, you know, 12 years younger. And I didn't think I would be able to recover uh, if, if I, you know, from that type of loss. And I, you know, my head was spinning like everybody else's and I was confused and baffled by it. But back to those lessons, stayed the course. I got a plan together. I kept consistent with that plan. Um, and, you know, we went on a very long bull market here. Now, the last little crash we had wasn't very helpful either but you got to have a plan as an investor and you have to be able to deal with those downturns because they come in that in markets they were propped up for a long time by those low interest rates but markets crash and markets rise and that's the nature and that's the ecosystem that we live in if we want to be market participants if you can't handle that if you can't handle the heat as they say you know get out of the kitchen but if you want to try to get that long-term appreciation of growth and, and and make money in the long term through investing you have to be able to stand it, but you can only stand it if you have a plan. And I only, I also um, uh, read some quick story, maybe if it's all also true or false, about you investing in Lehman Brothers back then. Is it is it correct? Is it true? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And that's exactly why I say that I can't outsmart the market. Uh -huh. I'm sitting there in 2008 in, in the summer watching Lehman Brothers, a legacy, you know, United States financial institution in his, you know, 80 or 90 years old, I'm watching it, um, you know, plummet from $90 a share to $20 a share yeah. to $9 a share. And I'm saying no one's going to let Lehman Brothers go out of business. This is Lehman Brothers. This is Wall Street. That's like, you know, letting the Brooklyn Bridge crumble. Uh, sure enough, I buy a lot of Lehman stock thinking I can outsmart the market and I know what's going on and I lose it all. It's still, yeah, I still had the symbol in my portfolio, in my, uh, in my online brokerage account, just to remind me how silly I am for thinking that I, I knew better. 
Thank you very much for sharing this. Uh, we also have a, one NBA player, Czech NBA player, who also invested in Lehman Brothers back then. And uh, the story was very similar to, to yours. Um, yeah, we can commiserate over that. Yeah. And so when we, when we look back a little bit to younger version of you, of Caleb, um, how, how was your feeling about the money? So what the money meant for you Uh, when we go from that early age maybe of your childhood to now how do how do maybe what's your opinion what opinions change about money well i grew up relatively comfortably but there was some financial instability um and i experienced that as a teenager i'm not complaining i had you know my parents sent me to a great school they took very good care of me but there was instability uh, and uncertainty and from a very early age from about 12 years old actually Um, I started working. I started working in restaurants um, when you could. They didn't have uh, very strict labor laws at that point mm -hmm. in time. You couldn't do that today, but I started doing that. And I started trying to make my own money because I wanted to have that kind of control. I never wanted to depend on anybody um, for spending money at that time, but really I wanted financial independence at an early age. So I started working young and um, that taught me a lot of lessons, especially in the restaurant business, which is a very difficult business. Um, but one in which you can learn all the aspects of a business from supply chain management, when you're talking about inventory for food, to uh, customer service, people walking in the door, uh, to profit margins, uh, the whole um, business experience you can see, the whole ecosystem you can see through a restaurant. So I learned a ton from a very early age and I learned some skills that were valuable to me that allowed me to make money over time. So having that, being able to make my own money and, and having it and learning how to invest it. And my father is a as an investment banker. So I was kind of around an ecosystem, a culture of business plans and planning and investing. Um, I learned more and more about it. I would read Forbes and Fortune um, that my dad would get, um, but I never thought I would be a business journalist. I became a TV documentary producer, producing nature documentaries, um, environmental educational documentaries, and traveling all over Central and South America. But I had this in the back of my head that I, you know, I understood this world a little bit. Um, But I was able to build a small business business doing documentaries and videos. And then when I, you know, I told you about my experience coming from New York University to Bloomberg, it was accidental in a lot of ways, but in a way it wasn't. It was almost full circle, you know, from learning about business and learning about managing my own money as a as a teenager, um, to then becoming a, a documentary maker and then coming back into a world where I could use my TV skills to to work in business news. You know, all of that sort of seemed to come together for me. And, you know, fast forward 23 years later, and I'm, you know, I'm lucky enough to be the editor in chief of Investopedia, um, you know, where we reach so many people, it's, it's kind of unbelievable to me, the journey, but it all started with that wanting to know, to understand how money worked and wanting financial independence. And now I feel like I'm helping to teach that, which is to me, the ultimate honor. Did you have any loan uh, after your graduation? No, I was lucky enough I didn't have loans after mm -hmm. my graduation. Um, my parents uh, paid for college. I think my grandmother, I think they paid for three of the years. My grandmother paid for one of the years. Uh, I think that's how it worked. But anyway, the, my parents took care of me in that respect, which is the ultimate gift. Mm -hmm. Because when you graduate with loans, you're already about $30,000 in the U.S. behind the eight ball, just getting started. So I was lucky enough to not have that. But I was also a person that could not handle debt. I do not like having debt. Um, so I hated carrying uh, credit card balances. Um, I didn't even like paying the car payment. Um, you know, I'd like to get all that out of the way, but I was lucky enough to, to graduate debt free. Because this is for me very uh, interesting perspective. I'm trying to find out um, because many Americans um, does have a debt uh, after graduation, after university. And uh, here people in Central Europe basically doesn't have any. Uh, so because schools are, are uh, government schools and uh, it's free. So I'm thinking if I'm graduating and I have debt this $10,000 of dollars and more, uh, did it, that, does it push me to uh, be more aggressive with my money, to invest more my money? Uh, so my, my mindset is said like, okay, I want to pay off my debts as early as possible. Or it's maybe uh, more like stressful factor uh, for my future investment decisions. What do you think when you are looking around uh, maybe your friends or your colleagues? That's a great question. Student loan debt is one of those debts that's kind of with you for a long time. It's a lot of money. But typically the interest rates on it are 
fairly low. So the debt mm -hmm. payment, um, while it, you feel it every month, it's not, it can be a few hundred dollars. And that can be painful for people, especially when you're only earning, you know, uh, maybe a couple of thousand dollars a month. So I know that that's hard. That said, um, you should not let that debt payment get in the way of investing for the future because the earlier you start investing, the faster your, the, your money starts compounding, right? You want to be investing a consistent amount or growing the amount you invest over time and earning a little bit of interest. And that interest compounds into the next year. And then that compounds into the next year. So you're, you're, gonna, you're, 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 you're relying on the magic of compound interest, which really grows your money over time. You've got to set that up separately than paying down your debt. You've got to think about those things separately. I get money in it every month. I know I have some debt service payments to make over here for my student loans, but I got to pay myself first. And that means investing $100 a month um, or adding $100 or $200 a month um, to, the, to my future. Get your future going over here. Deal with the current debt payments over here. Channelize those things so you don't, you're not weighed down aggressively by the debt every month. And uh, regarding like you are parents, right? L right? Like you told us, you have you have children. So, uh, do you feel pressure to make um, um, to invest uh, to to save some money for when your when your kids will go to university? Is it is it like pressure for you? Like yes, I have to do it, or uh, what's maybe your feelings about this? Yeah, I, I feel it's important. Um, because I was lucky enough to have college paid for uh, by me. I know you do, college is generally typically free or, or cheap, relatively cheap um, in the Czech Republic and throughout Europe. So it's a very different type of mentality. Here, uh, a private school, one year college tuition could be $75,000 or more. So that's pretty intense. Mm -hmm. um, that said, the gift of education is probably the, one of the best ones I could give to my kids. So for me, it was very important. And I started, and we have plans here, savings and investing plans here in the US. They, they go state by state, uh, and there's a federal one you can get involved with if, if you want, but usually state by state. So in New York State, where I am, there's an investing program. They give you a variety of options to invest in. You can set up an automatic program, and I've been doing that basically since they were about one years old. Um, and that's part of my monthly plan, too. When I get paid every month, there's the money that goes to pay for housing. There's the money that goes to the college saving. There's my own uh, retirement account. There's my wife and my savings plan and there's the other, you know, everything is, everything mm -hmm. has got a little bit of a schedule for when it gets, needs to get paid, but that's definitely one of them because I don't want to be 60 uh, odd years old trying to come up with that kind of money to pay for my kids. Yeah. And, and so you, we are getting a little bit to maybe your investment strategy. So um, I, we don't need like concrete numbers, but just maybe sure. if we talking about asset allocation, the percentage uh, ways of when you invest your money uh, to which uh, assets can we can I, uh, talk about it sure absolutely um even though i am closer to 50 really close to 50 um still young where typically you'd see a, a more balanced portfolio i am much heavier on the equity side i'd say probably about 75 percent um i have equity exposure in the u.s to large cap stocks but also um, throughout the world in emerging markets and even in Europe in, in certain sectors. I am a, um, I would say a conscious investor or a, a, um, a socially responsible investor to the degree that I can. So I typically choose funds, whether they're mutual funds, index funds or ETFs um, that have social impact or um, certainly nothing in the mining or energy or tobacco uh, uh, oil and gas or, or tobacco industry. So I try to be mindful of that. What about um, pharmacy? I do have a, I do have uh, mm -hmm. exposure to pharmacies through index funds and ETFs um, and biotech in general, because that's a sector that I believe in long-term. Um, I don't buy individual stocks. Like I said, I'm terrible at that. Um, I have some individual stocks that have been gifted to me or are part of uh, um, uh, uh, compensation packages over time. I don't go out and pick individual stocks because I'm terrible at that, but I will pick individual sectors that I believe in through what we call exchange traded funds. I don't know if you're aware of those, but those are what we call ETFs. Those are baskets of stocks in a sector. Uh, so I've done that in technology for sure. And for my children, I'm investing for them and their own custodial accounts that we look at together so I can educate them about this. I have them invested in technology and in water resources, um, um, and in uh, healthcare as well. So 
we try to, you know, I try to teach them that, you know, what, how to invest and then what's inside these companies. And so that's kind of how I allocate. And I do have a, a tremendous amount of uh, fixed income exposure here in the U.S. mostly, um, but also in some uh, larger economies. Too. Uh -huh. What about real estate? Um, you know, it's funny. I don't own any real estate anymore. I sold my apartment a couple of years ago after living in it here in New York for 14 years because we needed a bigger place. Um, so I don't own any real estate per se, and I don't have a lot of exposure through my portfolios to real estate. It's not that I don't believe in it. Um, it's just that uh, when I need it, you kind of need a lot of money to make a little money in real estate. So I don't really have that to do yet, but maybe one day when I get older. Um This is this is question would also uh, comes comes with uh, with uh, a lot of feelings because it's uh, uh, it's interesting to talk about this unlimited uh, quantitative easing you know from Fed and other uh, other central banks and many people are being like scared or feared that this will mean that there will be a lot of bubbles uh, that there will be more poor people and uh, reach also so it will be difficult um, to to catch up with our uh, living standard and that it can be very messy uh, down the road so do you think bitcoin or any other cryptocurrencies are uh, safe net against this inflation in over the period of time absolutely not um, i think bitcoin is very interesting and i don't doubt the viability of it but it is um it is not backed by any assets that the rest of the world can tie monetary value to. Yes, you can change Bitcoin for dollars, but let's just make sure that we all understand that Bitcoin doesn't have an underlying asset like the, um, you know, the full faith and credit of the United States. Um, that said, it does have a future. Clearly, people are enthusiastic about it. I also own a little bit of Bitcoin because I wanted to experience what that mm -hmm. was like. So I'm not saying I would never touch it. Um, I, I think that... Um, But back to what you're saying, quantitative easing and the extent of the monetary policy being exercised here in the United States and around the world is something we have never seen before on this scale. And it will have longer term impacts. It's hard to know what those are because we've never seen it implemented here. But throughout Europe, throughout Asia, um, many developed countries have negative interest rates right now. So investors who are buying uh, treasuries in those countries are doing it for no return just because either they have to or they, they have no other place for their money. So we don't know what that means in terms of inflation down the road. That's the big concern. We haven't had inflation, though, in years, and we've had pretty low interest rates. And if you look across other countries that have had negative interest rates, inflation is not their problem. In Japan, they've been plagued with what we call stagflation for years. So pretty low rates, but nothing, you know, the, the economy basically hasn't moved until recently. So that I don't think should be the immediate concern. The the bigger concern, and it's something that I'll probably deal with or my kids will probably have to deal with, is especially in the United States, when the balance sheet, the Fed's balance sheet and the Treasury spends as much money as it has, almost three trillion, I think this, you know, this year uh, alone, what does that mean to entitlements for Social Security um, and Medicare and the other benefits that people get in the United States because they pay taxes. This is part of the deal. We pay taxes in order to have those benefits. Those accounts are being um, diminished or will be diminished by all of this spending. And what does that mean as the population gets older? That's a huge concern. Now, it also means because the Fed has put so much monetary policy and the, Fed and the government has put so much stimulus that the financial markets, the stock markets are reacting a lot faster because they know the Fed is going to prop up financial assets. That's just part of the way it works. So the stock market has already responded 25% since its lows in March. But real people, the people that have lost their jobs now 30 odd million since uh, the, for the last seven weeks, 33 million people, they don't feel that at all. Yes, they have money invested in the stock market, but they've lost their jobs and they don't have income. And suddenly the stock market's taking off again, but the real economy is going the other way, that's going to become very frustrating in the US and it's going to happen in other countries too. Yeah. And, and when we also touch the, the um, uh, kids topic, so what will you maybe recommend to our listeners who wants to teach their kids about money, about value of money? Uh, do you have maybe, maybe uh, some tips or tricks which you use in your household? 
Well, I think the first and most important thing is to make sure you're having the conversation about money. For a lot of people and a lot of families, it's taboo. Nobody wants to speak about it. But it's probably one of the most important conversations you can have because you can learn a lot from it. And I think a great place to start with that is by just saying, hey, this is what mommy and daddy do for a living. This is where I work. This is my job. This is what I get paid. This is what we do with the money I get paid. This much goes to rent. This much goes to food. This much goes to pay for your babysitter, right? Make them part of that conversation about how the family ecosystem around money works because they suddenly become involved. They become participants. They get it. You start with that foundation of here's what I do. Here's what comes in. Here's what goes out. Um, here's what I'm trying to do. You know, here's the job I really want. Um, not so I can make the money, but this is what I want to be doing with my time. And I got a raise. Hey, now we have this much more. Or mm -hmm. I lost my job. This is what it means. We're going to have to start tightening the belt in certain areas. You want to be able to be candid about that. So I think that's a great place to start. Now, there's a lot of other places to learn uh, about money. Investopedia, we have a lot of financial literacy uh, for kids. We have a couple of uh, pieces we just put on YouTube to teach people just about banking and savings and investing, just the core basics. But there's plenty of other good literature and books for kids out there. Um, and then there's some of the classic, you know, if you're ready for more advanced uh, reading, just classic business stories about people like Warren Buffett um, or learning about long-term investing by some of the great business writers and investors of all time. Reading about the way people make money and the way businesses work is a great place to start. And do you also talk about your income in your household? Like with kids? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we do because we want them to have that type of awareness. Now they're teenagers now. So, yeah. you know, they're, they understand the conversation a little bit more. Um, and especially because I'm a business journalist, we talk about it a lot, maybe too much. They're probably tired of hearing it uh, <laughs> from me, but I do want them to know what's going on, what I spend my time doing. Now we're all working from home. I'm downstairs in the family room here on TV and speaking with you all day. So they hear me blah, blah, you know, all day long. Um, but I want them to be aware of what we're talking about. And I want them to know what I do, what I make, what my career path has been, because I want them to be able to have that type of um, uh, thinking in the back of their head. They're too young to know what they want to do, and I don't want them to, to come up with that. But even when I was 15, I had ideas of how I could, how the, you know, I could navigate some of the waters. I had a, a, an inkling of the thing I wanted most, and which is still my North Star. The, build, the ability to use communication, the ability to use media to help educate people. That's my job. That's my goal in life, right? I'm the editor-in-chief of Investopedia, and that's terrific. And that's my vehicle for doing that. But it's always been about that one thing. I want them to get that one thing so they can start building their careers that way. Mm -hmm. And what was your best investments over the year? We don't have to um, talk only about the financial investments regarding profits and and annual profits and percentage, but maybe from from wider perspective about book or uh, buying lunch to some uh, uh, smart guy who teaches something, yeah. whatever. So do you have any? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, my best investment was probably buying that television camera um, <laughs> when I was about 22, 23 years old and learning how to, to shoot uh, for television, to become a TV cameraman for television. Why? Because that led me on a career to become a documentary producer. It led me to South America where I met my wife. Um, it led me back to New York uh, where I was able to start a career in journalism. It led me you know, to all the, a lot of the great things that have happened to me personally and professionally. So just, I don't know why I wanted to do that, but uh, you know, I, was, I was really into documentaries and that was important for me. My best financial investment um, has been my wife. Now, yeah, she's tremendous and, and uh, she's been my, the, the best investment I've made, period. Um, but my best financial investment has been real estate. Uh, I did buy an apartment in New York City years ago when interest rates were low and down payments. You didn't need a lot of money to make a down payment. And I, and I went for it. Um, and we lived in it for 14 years and was able to sell it before a lot of this madness happened. So that was timing, but it was also realizing that interest rates um, were very low and I didn't need a lot of money to get into that market. And that was an important financial lesson for me as well. Thank you very much. And what, maybe one of the last questions, what's, what's a challenge for you uh, in future, for you personally, and also for Investopedia? Well, um, let's start with Investopedia, because as I said, we're 21 years old. And um, 
you know, it's great to have that type, type of legacy. The most important thing for us is building and increasing that we have with our reader. We hear them every single day, the good, the bad, and the ugly. They write us and they tell us they love us. They write us and they tell us what we could do better. They write us and they tell us when we're wrong. So it's important for us to keep responding to that and listening to our readers and also following what's going on in the financial world because it's getting more and more confusing and making sure we're answering their questions. We are who we are because we built that loyalty over the years and we take it very seriously. So staying true to the mission and, and focusing on really helping people out, that's our job and that's the biggest challenge. And it sounds simple, but sometimes the simplest things are the hardest things. Uh, but I have a lot of faith in us and we have a great team of editors and we have a great team across our company and across our parent company, Dot Dash, with all the support you could possibly want as a publisher. So I'm grateful for that and I like where we are. Um, for me, uh, I'm trying to do stand-up comedy. And I was supposed to have my debut in April. Uh, uh, obviously, that didn't happen. But I guess I could do it over Zoom. But that's just a personal side bucket challenge. Um, but for me, you know, I, I've had a great career in business journalism. And I've lived through a lot of really interesting times in this business and through the economy. And this is one of them. I feel like I'm really lucky to be able to speak to you and to speak to other media, to talk, to educate people about what's going on and try to help them make sense of the world. Um, I'm not telling them what to buy or to sell or to hold. I'm just trying to help people think about it and help myself think about it in a way that I, th that I think is helpful. Uh, I think there's a place for that and a space for that. I think we do it through Investopedia, and I think it's a great place for me to be able to do that too. And I'm just so grateful that, that Investopedia sees that in me as well. We have this connection. So I'm, I want to deliver on our mission as well. Um, and I also want to make the right decisions and stay healthy and, and be a good dad and be a good citizen and and be good to the planet. So I got a lot of challenges, but I'm a super fortunate guy. And I really appreciate you wanting to speak with me. It's really nice to talk to you. Caleb, I thank you that you find the time. And maybe next, next year when I will get to New York and you will have this premiere or not premiere, it can be second, third, fourth act of your uh, standing comedy. I would love to come. <laughs> So, uh, so you're invited. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I just invited myself. Thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. I'm looking forward to, to to seeing it. Thank you very much for your time, uh, which you put in us. Your experience. It was it was great talk. Uh, I hope that our listeners caught all these nuances which you which you talked about. And uh, looking forward to doing some some time in future. Wishing you luck, your family, or also Investopedia. And best best regards to New York. Thank you. And you stay safe and healthy over there. And when you come to New York, we're having some check-ins. Thank you, Caleb. Bye-bye. Take care.